Welcome to today's roundtable webinar, uh, Climate Change and Security in Africa. Uh, my name is Joe Siegel. I'm the Director of Research at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. And on behalf of all of my colleagues, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining us to today's session. We are grateful to have four really outstanding panelists with us today to help us think through the linkages between climate change and security. These include uh, Dr. Francois Engelbrecht, who's a climate scientist at Witts University, Johannesburg, South Africa. Uh, Mr. Andrew Mambodiani, a freelance journalist based in Mutare, Zimbabwe. Dr. Uh, Epi Bore Seifa, uh, a lecturer at Bayes University in Abuja, Nigeria, and Dr. Oluwole Ajawole, the coordinator for Central Africa for ENACT, our organized crime observatory at the Institute for Security Studies in Dakar, Senegal. Our agenda today will be to um, hear some opening remarks from our panelists and then to open up for question and answers from the audience. Now, it's increasingly well recognized that Africa is expected to suffer the greatest near-term effects from climate change, despite having contributed the least carbon emissions of any region in the world. These stresses are expected to add to land pressure on the continent, where already two-thirds of uh, the continent's inhabitants rely on the land for their livelihoods. This will be adding to the um, already record levels of uh, 30 million people who are forcibly displaced due to conflict or repressive governments. So projections are that we could see um, tens of millions additional climate migrants um, in the coming decades. Now, because the effects between climate change and security are often indirect, and incremental, um, they are often overlooked and misunderstood. So today's session is intended to help us connect the dots and to help understand how these relationships play out uh, over time. Um, I'd like to begin with a uh, focus on the scientific foundation for this relationship and specifically how, how climate changes change, how, is, how climate changes uh, affecting the security environment in Africa. And uh, I am particularly interested in looking at the most disruptive climate events that we can expect to see in Africa here over the next 10 to 20 years. To do that, I'd like to start with uh, Dr. Francois Engelbrecht. As mentioned, he's a climate scientist at Witts University in uh, Johannesburg. And he's also the lead author of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC's special report on global warming from 2018, uh, where they looked at the tipping points uh, of climate change and how this can uh, affect uh, the uh, inhabitability of uh, regions across the world. He is currently the co-lead author of the Physical Sciences Working Group uh, of the IPCC Assessment Report. And Dr. Engelbrecht is also the co-principal investigator of the Future Climate for Africa um, Research Consortium. So without further ado, um, let me turn it over to you, Dr. Engelbrecht. Thank you so much, uh, Joe, for the introduction. Um, good morning and good afternoon and good evening, everybody. Um, I am very grateful to Joe and his colleagues for this invitation to present to you some of the latest evidence we have on future climate change in the African continent. Okay. So um, as you've mentioned, Joe, I'm going to focus specifically on something that I think is really of critical importance in terms of climate change impacts in Africa, but also specifically from a security perspective, namely tipping points in the climate system. Now, 
I think many people may have heard about global tipping points, but I think we are not yet sufficiently aware of the possibility of a regional tipping point occurring in the African climate system. So that's what I want to get to in this very quick talk. I think I have only 15 minutes, so let me, let me take you through the slides. Um, what, I'm, what I'm presenting today is largely based on the IPCC Assessment Report 6 Working Report 1, a Working Group 1 report published in August last year. Keep your eyes open for the Working Group 2 report if everything goes according to plan and government, the governments give their approval, the report will be released this coming Monday. That's the report on impacts. Uh, the report I'm talking about is the one on the physical science base of climate change. It, it, the report was called the Code Red for Humanity by the United Nations Secretary General. One reason for that is that Earth is warming in even faster than we thought it would warm some years ago. And the window to avoid catastrophic impacts is closing. I want to get today to those catastrophic impacts. Very brief background. This type of graph, I think everybody has seen, it's a global warming projection. On the x-axis, we are looking at time. On the y-axis, we are looking at the level of global warming. The dark red line is a future where the world continues to rely largely on fossil fuels. In such a case, we are heading towards global warming of five degrees towards the end of the century. And uh, the light blue line at the other end of the graph is really the Paris Agreement type future, where we do everything that we can to, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And then, we, then the report says it's probably already too late to avoid 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming, the one important threshold. Um, but we may still be able to keep global temperature increase below two degrees Celsius. If we think about what will happen in our own lives in the next 20 years, this report has found that it's very likely, it's likely that we will exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming when the early 2030s is just around the corner. We are already at 1.1 degrees Celsius of global warming. And one of the, the critical impacts in Africa I want to talk about today is relates to this graph. Um, this shows us greenhouse gas emissions, um, specifically on the left-hand side, we're looking at carbon dioxide emissions, the dark red line that sends us on that rapid world of continued global warming, rapid continued warming. is of course associated with continued carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere. And the light blue line, is the opposite, the Paris Agreement type future. Now, there's a risk associated with this in Africa. I think it's very clear that at least the current administrations in the, in the United States, Japan, South Korea, the European Union, the United Kingdom, they will be pursuing these paths of strong mitigation. And increasingly, they will require from their partners to also pursue that path. Um, if African countries should choose to rather stay on the fossil fuel path, path, I think there are major economic risks we will be facing in African countries. I want to talk briefly about that today. But more importantly, I'm going to talk about, and more extensively, I'm going to talk about climate change impacts. Now, now I'm getting to the actual topic of my presentation, tipping points. And this is the last introduction graphs before, before I start talking about tipping points. Top left is the same graph I've just shown, levels of global warming into the future. Top right, the same thing, but now we are looking at rainfall. And you can see that across the world, this is uh, specifically for the world's land masses combined, precipitation is projected to increase as the world continues to warm. That comes with a range of risks and impacts. Um, and here on the left-hand side, not really important for Africa through direct impacts, only indirectly, um, but just for your interest sake, eh? this is Arctic sea ice. Under these fossil fuel futures of future economic growth, Arctic sea ice disappears in summer. By the middle of the century, it's gone. A unique and precious ecosystem gone um, under these strong mitigation worlds by the middle of the century. And then at the right-hand side bottom, future sea level rise. Now, 
and a Paris Agreement type future, we should be able to keep sea level rise this century below half a meter. But under fossil fuel futures, we are heading towards sea level rise that may be in the order of a meter or maybe even worse. That will displace hundreds of millions of people from where they are currently live, on, from where they are currently living during the course of the century. That brings me to the topic I want to introduce, tipping points. And I just want to mention briefly what is a global tipping point. Global tipping points are critical points in the climate system where changes will occur that are irreversible. Now, the main global tipping point that everybody is worried about is the Greenland ice sheet. The science tells us that somewhere between 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius of global warming, the melting of the Greenland ice sheet may become irreversible. And that is called a tipping point. A change becomes stronger and stronger, but at some point it just reaches a critical point where it can no longer be turned around. Now, should the Greenland, Greenland ice, cap, ice sheet melt away completely, that six meters of sea level rise globally, it will take thousands of years to melt away completely. But already in this century, as I've mentioned, under such a scenario, hundreds of millions of people from the world's low-lying areas will be displaced from where they are living today. Um, so sea level rise is a very good example of a change that is actually irreversible. Once the sea level has, has risen, there's no way we can get that water back into the ice in the lifetime of humans. And now really starting to talk about our own continent. What can happen in terms of climate change on our own continent, Africa, that can be devastating? that can be unprecedented in terms of its impacts. Um, to, to make a list of such tipping points, I just want to share two basic climate projections with you. One showing future temperature patterns and one showing future rainfall patterns. So yeah, we are looking at how different regions of the world will warm as a function of the average warming, the global warming. So if the one point, if the global, if the globe or the world on the average has warmed by 1.5 degrees Celsius, the first thing that you should notice is that in the subtropical parts of Africa, in the Sahel and the Sahara, and in subtropical Southern Africa, we will be facing substantially higher warming than the global average warming. That's a really important fact. Um, in Botswana, for example, if we look at the data of the last five decades, the rate of global warming is a staggering three, uh, sorry, the rate of regional warming is a staggering three times the rate of global warming. Now, if the world should warm by three degrees or four degrees globally, so if the Paris Agreement is not successfully implemented, the changes in subtropical Africa in the north and in the south become devastating. We are then looking at temperature increases in the order of six degrees Celsius. And that will end the way of life we know today in these parts of Africa. I, I will talk later on very soon actually about what I mean with, when I say that. Um, sorry, um, the last thing I want to show before I then list the tipping points um, as, as Joe asked me to do, is the changes in precipitation. Very interesting. Once again, we are looking at the patterns of change as a function of the level of global warming. What is so interesting is how diverse the changes will be in Africa. You can see that rainfall increases are projected in general in East Africa and across much of the Sahel. Just think about what the implications may be on biodiversity and agriculture. In Southern Africa, however, the general projection is one of decreasing rainfall. So in a part of Africa, we have to deal with a world that is getting much warmer and drier. That brings a range of risks. In other parts of Africa, it becomes, it's becoming substantially warmer as well, but wetter, that brings a different set of risk factors. Now, there's so much that 
so much research that is ongoing about climate change impacts in Africa. But today I just want to highlight, and I'm heading now already towards the end of my talk. I think it's just um, uh, this slide and um, the conclusions basically of, with a few graphs in between. Um, what are the worst things that can happen in Africa in terms of climate change? I think that's what we need to talk about. Can we reach certain thresholds of regional increases in temperature, for example, with which are associated collapse in African economic systems or agricultural systems? I'm briefly going to talk about five such tipping points. The first one goes back to that slide I've shown in the beginning on the climate change mitigation futures, the reduction in emissions. No time for me to elaborate on this, but I, I suspect it's clear to everybody that if Africa's main trade partners, if the European Union, the UK, um, and also Japan, South Korea, and the US, if this group of countries that are a powerful economic bloc in the world make the transition towards renewable energy, but African economies such as my own country, South Africa, cling to coal, as its power source, it's going to be left behind. It will not be able to take advantage of the massive investments that are now being directed towards renewable energy. So clinging to fossil fuels bring a, a massive risk to economies. It, it brings the risk of major economic collapse even, or at least very slow growth if you end up with these stranded assets in your economy, instead of taking advantage of the economic growth that potentially can be obtained through investments in Africa in the renewable sector. But now I'm going to use, for those other four points I have on that slide, I'm just going to list them one by one by individual slides. What, what do I mean with tipping points in terms of climate change impacts in Africa? Firstly, I think, in Tanzania and in southern Mozambique and in northeastern South Africa, something that has never happened before can now occur. And here I'm talking about the landfall of a category four or five hurricane, as these systems are known in the North Atlantic Ocean. Now, this is something that can happen in central Mozambique, and it has happened a few times, just a handful of times in the past, but it has happened. For example, tropical cyclone Idai, which was a category four hurricane year and the satellite picture, just before it made landfall in Mozambique. And when it made landfall on the 14th of March, 2019, it killed in the end more than a thousand people. It's the biggest flood disaster that ever occurred in Africa south of the equator. And it is a clear example of an unprecedented event, something that has never happened before, now happened. Now in central Mozambique, the landfall of intense cyclones is not so uncommon. Category four or five is uncommon, but it does happen. What is far less common is for such a cyclone to occur further to the north towards Dar es Salaam, or further to the south at Maputo or into South Africa. Now, the climate change report from the IPCC published in August last year is saying this is a risk. Be aware of the fact that because of regional warming, this can now occur for the first time that these systems can survive so far to the south or to the north. And of course, that, uh, that brings unprecedented impacts in terms of storm surge, flooding, high winds, in the wake of such a storm, crops are often devastated, like with Idai in Mozambique. So there's a range of security risks immediately around landfall and in the months following landfall of such an intense tropical cycle. Next risk, day zero type droughts in the big African cities. I must be very brief explaining this, but the South African examples are important. The city of Cape Town almost ran out of water in 2017. And in Johannesburg, we almost ran out of water at the end of 2016, due to droughts that last for three to four years at an end. Now, the climate change report is clear that in Southern Africa and in the Sahel in the South, stretching from West Africa all the way through to East Africa, 
the risk for droughts that last three to four years at an end is increasing. Now that's a massive risk. Our subsistence farmers can usually survive a drought. They can keep on going maybe for two or three years. But when a, drought, when a drought starts to last for four or five or six years, as we have seen in recent years in Zimbabwe and in Madagascar and in earlier years in, in the Southern Sahel, then of course the subsistence farmers can no longer sustain that way of living and they tend to move to the African cities. So the cities themselves then come under pressure of, of, of reduced water availability. And just think about the massive consequences if a city such as Johannesburg runs out of water. What are the economic consequences? Um, so the risk of day zero routes is increasing. And I think economically, this is maybe the, 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 the currently the current the current biggest risk, single risk that we face in these parts of Africa I've mentioned because of regional warming. Now, a long lasting drought, of course, it affects the maize crop in East Africa, in Southern Africa, and also the cattle industry. Here's a shocking fact. If the world should warm by three degrees Celsius globally, and it's six degrees in the Sahel and in Southern Africa, we will no longer be able to keep cattle in this region. And that is simply because of the biophysical effects of the heat stress in mammals. Um, there will just be so many days with life-threatening heat stress for cattle that we will not be able to farm with cattle anymore in these parts of Africa. That's for me almost impossible to imagine Botswana, for example, without cattle. And then finally, we should not we should not forget that we as human beings are also mammals and we are just as vulnerable to heat strain as the animals are. And it affects our productivity. So human comfort is of course affected. If we should face more heat waves, more intense heat waves, and the report is very clear that already in the next decade, Africa will experience heat waves of an unprecedented intensity an intensity we've never experienced before. It will firstly affect our human comfort. It, for those of us that can afford air conditioning and for businesses that can afford air conditioning, that, need, that means more energy, more costs. But most important is the impact of heat, of heat waves on people that live in informal settlements that don't have air conditioning, especially if the settlement doesn't provide easy access to cool water. That, colleagues, is life threatening. We see these types of heat waves taking lives everywhere in the world. An uh, important recent example was in the Pacific Northwest. The risk is an immense one in our African cities and the informal settlements. And remember, I call it a tipping point because the heat waves will be unprecedented. We have no, ex no previous experience of heat waves of, of this intensity. Now, the, the concluding slide. I do want to point out that we are facing major risks. I want to point out one positive aspect of that. We know what the risks are. Now, climate, climate science tells us to a large extent what the risks are. So there's time, there's at least time to prepare to some extent for these risks. Um, and then it's not too late to still slow down global warming. It is probably too late to avoid 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming from occurring. But it's not too late to avoid 2 degrees Celsius of global warming from occurring. So we can still avoid some of these impacts. We can still avoid, avoid some of these tipping points from occurring in the first place. And that is why it's important for us to take climate change action, both in terms of mitigation, reducing emissions, and in terms of adaptation, preparing for the future. So I really hope this, this presentation will help us with the, the panel discussion that now that I think will follow soon. And back to you, Joe. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Francois. Yes, that uh, is just what I was looking for, giving us that foundation. And uh, you sparked a lot of uh, attention and interest, I'm sure, among our, uh, our uh, participants. <clears throat> and I'm sure we'll pick up uh, many of these things in our, our question and answer. But thank you and especially for helping us focus on some of these tipping points 
on the uh, likelihood of more and more intense cyclones, uh, devastating effects on the on the coast and and cause uh, widespread flooding. The expectation of uh, more um, heat waves and and more periods of extended drought and the impacts that this will have on the habitability and livelihoods uh, across the continent. Um, and and uh, yes, the realities of the day zero um, countdowns that uh, South Africa faced, I think are, are something that we'll need to be thinking about uh, for other parts of the continent. So thanks for setting that up and helping us understand some of the ways these climate changes, these climate effects are going to um, shape uh, human behavior. And that uh, will allow us to transition to talk about climate migration. Um, and uh, I'd like to have a, a discussion now with uh, Mr. Andrew Mambodiani, who is a freelance journalist based out of Mutare, Zimbabwe. He has written for a number of uh, international uh, uh, and African publications, including the Thomas Reuters Foundation and BBC, Mongo Bay, and Yale 360. Um, and uh, he focuses in his writing on uh, the effects of climate change, and in particular, the effects uh, of climate migrants. Uh, Andrew lives in the Eastern Highlands of Zimbabwe, which uh, has been a focal point for receiving climate migrants in Zimbabwe. And so he'll draw on his experience. He's been interviewing um, many of the migrants there for a number of years, and so can provide us some firsthand uh, illustrations and anecdotes that can help us understand the personal uh, dynamics involved. And while his focus will be on Zimbabwe, I think after listening to uh, Dr. Engelbrecht's talk, we can see how this pattern can be replicated in other parts of the continent. So uh, with that, uh, Andrew, welcome. And uh, maybe you could start by just telling us uh, approximately how many climate migrants um, have moved into the Eastern Highlands and you know, what are they saying is causing them to, to come there? Okay, thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, okay, before I go, uh, uh, into some details about climate migration here in Zimbabwe. Possibly I should express my fear as a journalist based in Zimbabwe. My biggest fear is that, of course, I'm, I'm not trying to be an alarmist, but my biggest fear is that the next big civil conflict here in Zimbabwe will be over the control of water, the control of fertile land, the control of grazing land, not diamonds or gold. So when it comes to the issue of migration here in Zimbabwe, people are moving from lower dry areas to the Eastern Highlands, which is along the border with Mozambique. So here we are talking of farmers and these farmers are not migrating into the cities because they don't have a life in the cities. They want an area where they can grow their crops, they can uh, keep their animals. So even though we don't have uh, the actual documentation, especially from the government, because right now the government says these people or these farmers are illegal settlers or squatters. So there are no uh, documentation of how many people actually have migrated to the Eastern Highlands. But here we are talking of tens of thousands of people, more than 20,000. Uh, had migrated to the Eastern Highlands by around uh, uh, 2015. So the issue is very critical and the issue is very serious because here the Eastern Highlands had already people who were living in those areas. So there's now conflict over water, conflict over land, conflict over grazing land. So this is going to be a serious, serious issue if nothing is done to address this, uh, this issue. Of course, I understand migration is one of the, the adaptation strategies by, by the farmers, but if it's not done properly, it's going to result in very, very big problems here in Zimbabwe. 
Thanks, uh, uh, Andrew. Um, so you've painted for us the very serious threat that uh, climate migrants are, are facing and, and how that's uh, um, escalating the risk of, of, of water conflict and other uh, environmental challenges. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, the, you know, the testimonials you're getting from some of the climate migrants? And you know what is causing them to uh, to move, and and what are they saying? Okay, in, in most cases, the, the, this uh, uh, ghost we are talking of, these are farmers. They've been trying everything, particularly during the uh, uh, 2017 to, two, uh, uh, to 2020 uh, serious drought, which affected uh, most parts here in Zimbabwe. They've tried everything. Because in most cases, when it comes to migration, that will be the last resort. After the farmers have tried uh, the different crops, uh, try to do almost everything. And most of these farmers, uh, when I talk to, to them, they have said, we have no option but to move. We know that uh, it's a challenge to go to the Eastern Islands where there are uh, other settlers or other farmers but we've got no choice. That is the only option available. But the, the only challenge is the government is not addressing the root cause of the, these migrations. Because the, these people are migrating because their source of livelihoods have been affected by, by the droughts. So they are looking for better opportunities, but it's going to create another problem, especially here in the Eastern Islands, because of course, uh, uh, the Eastern Islands cannot accommodate all the, 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 the people who are migrating to, to the area. So it's going to create a lot of problems. From the interviews I've done with most of these farmers, they've insisted that they did not want to move. That's what they say. They did not want to move, but they have no option. The only option available is to move. So you can see that migration in terms in most cases here in Zimbabwe is the last option. So I think uh, when it comes to addressing the, the whole issue is how best can these farmers be assisted to get life rules in their areas? Thanks, Andrew. So yeah, I think it's an important point that migration is the last resort. Um, people have already exhausted all the other coping mechanisms before they get to that point. And uh, the experience of increased drought, uh, shorter rainy season seems to be uh, um, part of the pattern we're seeing in Zimbabwe. Um, uh, you've talked about the, 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 migra the migrants coming into Eastern Highlands. How about the populations that were already there, the communities that um, uh, have their farms and are you know, were already settled? How are they uh, responding to these uh, migrants uh, when they arrive? Yep. Normally, this, uh, the, the farmers who had, because the Eastern Highlands, uh, there are farmers who were resettled by the government. So there are already farmers there. So these people who are coming, these migrants, they are occupying uh, some areas which were set aside for grazing animals, or some areas which are close to river sources or river banks. So this is affecting the water sources. For the, uh, for, for the farmers who were already in, the, uh, in, in, in this area. So in one interview with a, a banana farmer, he has been farming in that area for quite some time. And that area has been producing among the best bananas here in Zimbabwe, but it's being affected by lack of water. Because this, uh, when these people settle in along river banks, they are affecting the rivers through siltation, and they are diverting some of the, uh, the water to, to irrigate their, their, their crops. One dam which I visited in 2016, there was a dam, but now it's already covered with sand. It's already covered with silt. There is no water. And the farmers in these areas are now complaining, where do we, can we get water for our livestock, for our uh, crops? So it's already affecting some of the, 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 the farmers in this area. So these farmers are already complaining. At times, 
you know, uh, when the resources come, uh, when so many people are fighting for uh, the scarce resource, it becomes a challenge. So that's one of the biggest challenges. The farmers who were already settled in those areas, they are now complaining. But actually, they, they cannot do anything. Because they, 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 the migrants, they are saying, of course, we sh you should not call us a squatter. We are Zimbabweans. We are all Zimbabweans. And let's uh, also benefit from these Eastern Highlands, which are still receiving a, a lot of water. So that, that's uh, one of the, the, the biggest challenges. But for the farmers who are already settled there, it's one of the, the they don't even know how to uh, address the, the situation. OK, thank you. Uh, no, it sounds like the situation is escalating and uh, all sides are feeling more stressed. Um, I guess to wrap up then, what are some of the priorities that you feel or that the migrants you've talked to have, have uh, identified as um, uh, priorities that need to be undertaken for uh, responding to um, the current situation? Was first from what I've uh, seen and what I've observed, especially on the ground, there is little uh, research, especially on the impacts on of a uh, uh, climate migrant. Both actually, the, the government does not even acknowledge there is a challenge, because uh, for most of the things to be addressed, first there is need to do a proper research what is really happening in the Eastern Highlands or even across the whole country? What are the major issues? But from what I have heard from some of these farmers, they still need to be assisted while they are still in their uh, areas of uh, origin. They need uh, drought resistant crops. Of course, uh, of course, some of the, the farmers, they said, we have, we have tried almost everything, but we are not uh, getting any better result. But some are saying, let's try uh, some other uh, drought resistant crops, say a uh, small green crops, uh, some millets, uh, sorghum, and some of those, those, those crops. But still, some farmers are saying, since we are still, because most of the seasons, uh, they are becoming so short. Normally, our, uh, uh, the farming season or the rain season in Zimbabwe started uh, around uh, October up to around May. But now the rain season is starting uh, late or even uh, late November or uh, late December, and it's ending around March or April, somewhere there. But the farmers are saying, why don't we harvest some of this rainwater, especially for our long, the livestock, for irrigation? So they, they are saying, since we are still receiving, uh, of course, the, 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 uh, the rain seasons are becoming shorter, but we can harvest uh, that rainwater for future uses. And some of, some of, some of the farm was here in, uh, uh, in some parts of uh, Manikaland. There are some large water bodies, some dams, where uh, the water can be harnessed for irrigation. But most of these uh, uh, dams, they're just sitting idle. The water is not used for irrigation. So the farmers are saying, why don't we harvest this water for, 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 for irrigation? And of course, some experts are saying there is need for proper migration. If the, the government assists some of these people when they are migrating, it will be easier because they can be given uh, some resources so that they can have somewhere to start when, uh, when it comes to uh, their ag uh, agricultural activities. But there are still some other areas uh, where there are still a little bit of space where some of these farmers can be resettled, but if it's done properly, then I think uh, the, 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 these migrants can, can, can benefit. And also for the livestock farmers, they also need, uh, especially during the uh, dry uh, months, they are saying, well, we, we also need support, especially when it comes to supplementary feeding for, for the livestock during those uh, uh, dry months, normally, uh, around uh, uh, August and September or early October. So these are some of the, the issues which are the, the, the farmers say they need to be assisted with. Of course, as a journalist, I, my only issue is trying to give a voice, trying to give 
some uh, faces to some of these statistics which have been given. So I try to talk to the people. I try to go on the ground and hear what the people are saying. All right, well, thank you, Andrew. Uh, and that's exactly what we wanted to, to have you do, um, bring that personal story uh, into our discussion today. And uh, thanks for talking about some of those uh, priority actions that can be taken, especially to be more proactive and working with communities before they migrate both farmers and uh, herders so they can better adapt and mitigate some of the effects, um, which will greatly reduce the potential security implications uh, from uh, climate change. So thank you for that. Uh, we'll come back uh, when we open it up for question and answers. I'd like to switch now to talk about um, some of the more um, malignant uh, exploitation of climate change that we're seeing, especially with regards to organized crime. And for that, we have with us uh, Dr. Abibore Thifa, uh, who is a lecturer at Bayes University in Abuja, Nigeria. And she's involved in research that looks at regional security dynamics in West Africa, in particular, the effects of climate change on regional security. She has a forthcoming book looking at why organized violence thrives in Nigeria. Um, and uh, I think she's been one of the uh, pioneers in trying to unpack these linkages. And as I said at the top, this is difficult because a lot of times the, the linkages are incremental and indirect. Um, um, they're not as obvious. And so uh, we really welcome uh, Dr. Ibi's work and uh, look forward to, um, to, to gleaning some of the insights that she's gained. Um, so with that, uh, Dr. Ibi, um, can you can you just sketch out for us briefly some of the linkages that you're seeing between climate change and organized criminal groups? Okay, thank you very much. Um, I would like to start off by noting the the issue as regards whenever we have a conversation about um, insecurity in Africa as a result of transnational organized criminal groups, um, the emphasis on climate change is usually not um, fitted into the discourse of that conversation. And so most times that argument for that there's actually a link between climate change and either conflict or organized criminal activities in the continent is usually not reflected in the discourse. Um, but in trying to identify that link in most cases, I mean, the overarching argument is the fact that climate change and its impact on African um, security, or in this case, organized criminal groups in Africa, it's always, um, is always, I'm sorry, is viewed from the perspective of stressors or triggers, climate change factors trigger, triggering um, activities of criminality in the, in the region. And so in terms of the linkages and answering the question directly, the argument is from the perspective of the economic dimensions. And as um, the previous speakers have talked about, they highlighted, the issue of climate change or the impact of, on agricultural activities. Now, based on reports from World Bank as well as the African Development Bank, we find that at 60% of, <clears throat> excuse me, 60% of, of, um, of economic activities in Africa is from the agricultural sector. And in most cases, you have a large percentage of Africans involved in subsistence farming or transhumant um, livestock farming. And so all of all these are all dependent on the weather conditions, or in this case, the climate conditions in this region. And so you also have the added issue of misgovernance. And now it's one of the prevalent issues that we have in the African continent in terms of not having proper um, security governance policies implemented in the region that would at least serve as some form of barrier or some form of cushion for um, for Africans who are impacted by climate change conditions. And so um, individuals who depend on agriculture as a source of income, especially from uh, the small medium enterprises or small enterprise um, demographic, majority of them, when um, they are unable to farm as a result of either droughts or, or the impact on, on, on the farming soil, or in most cases not having enough 
cattle, um, sorry, not having enough fodder for their cattle. When they are being impact, impacted negatively, they have limited choices. Now they could choose to migrate into the big cities in the hope of you know, finding alternative source of income, which in most cases is always difficult because of the um, competition for economic activities there and as well as the issue of skills. Or they could choose to stay behind and um, they could choose to stay behind. And in most cases, they are vulnerable to criminal activities. Now, when we talk about criminal or organized criminal groups in Africa, in most cases, you don't really have the traditional forms of transnational organized criminal groups like what we have in Latin America. What we have here in Africa is more of criminal networks, groups who are actually involved in the logistics in terms of um, um, in terms of providing some certain product or services. And uh, what we have that is really quite prevalent is um, drug trafficking in most cases, not so much for consumption, but more of transiting these goods from, you know, from, from as in terms of Africa being a transit point down to, to consumer states. Or in most cases, we have human trafficking as a result of human smuggling. So these are some of the prevalent forms of organized criminal activities in Africa. And so, and Another dynamic to this conversation is also the prevalence of insurgent groups. Now, in as much as we do not, in academia, we tend to, there's a very distinct line between terrorist group or insurgent groups and criminal groups, but there is one thing they both have in common. And the one thing they have in common is money. In some cases, the terrorist or the insurgent, they need money to continue their activities and criminal groups are in the business for money as well. Another common denominator has to do with the fact that they need foot soldiers in, in the case of the insurgency, they need people who would, you know, wage this war for them. In the case of criminal networks, they need people who would work for them to carry out these illicit activities. And so you have these vulnerable individuals who have lost their source of livelihood as a result of climate change conditions, being forced to either migrate, knowing fully well they might not have jobs within the same country, the country or they have a choice of joining, well, not so much of a choice, but they have an option of joining these criminal networks. So I think um, those are some of the key linkages. And again, just to add real quickly to these linkages, we also have this thing, um, this issue of criminal groups as opportunists. And you know, when criminal groups are looking for an opportunity to make more money, and more importantly, to carry their list activities without any undue stress, from the, um, from the authorities, from the government. And so when they notice that there's an opportunity for them to smuggle goods and services, or in this case, smuggle humans, because I mean, like what Andrew, Andrew talked about the need to migrate and migration is one of those outcomes of climate change, economic migration in some cases. So people have to smuggle themselves out of the country in some cases because of some of the, um, um, the issues that has to do with getting relevant visas to leave the country. And so you see this opportunity for human smuggling. And unfortunately, trafficking you know, is one of the um, negative outcomes of, of human smuggling. And then you also, you also have the issue of organized criminal groups providing some form of illusion of being able to meet the needs of individuals in those, in those areas, um, especially in areas that are being um, racked with conflict as a result of climate change conditions. Thank you, uh, Ibi, that's great. Um, and so you really helped us understand uh, the climate change creates vulnerability among uh, communities, among households, which then can be exploited um, both uh, in terms of human smuggling and, and, and the fact that people are moving as well as, uh, as a potential means for recruitment um, for these groups. Um, so that tells us a little bit about the mechanisms. Can you tell us more about some of the specific sectors in which we see climate change contributing to organized criminal uh, activity? Yeah, um, so as I mentioned earlier on, we have um, different forms of organized criminal groups. Well, I think there's actually something that is quite unique, although the conversation has been there, but never really been fleshed out or linked. When we talk about environmental crime or green crimes, as, um, as they are now calling it now in, in academia, we talk about crimes against the environment in terms of, and this is manifested in different forms across the African continent, illegal logging, poaching, in most cases, illegal mining activities, and all of all this impact negatively on the environment. And all of all this feeds into some of the causes of climate change conditions. 
And so it's like we have this circle, this vicious circle, as I will call it, of climate change activities, whereby green criminal syndicates across the region, um, different parts of Africa, like in Senegal, where we have the illegal logging, for example, um, they, their activities causes those conditions that make it extremely difficult for individuals who are dependent on agricultural activities for their source of income. And so we have that really playing out there. And I think more recently, we also have another issue that is quite prevalent now in, um, in, in um, some parts of West Africa and Central Africa as well. And that has to do with banditry and human, um, human trafficking or, or kidnapping as well. That is quite prevalent there. And um, not too long ago, I think late last year, I had a conversation with some security um, officials here in Nigeria. And I did that because the Nigerian government in a bid to explain you know, this issue of banditry and, and kidnapping in, in our region, they claimed that a majority of those who are involved in these activities are actually from Chad and Niger. And so I spoke with some of these security officials to get you know, a, little, a clearer picture. And they said, that, yes, there's a possibility of that. And then they did a little bit of his, um, history for me. They told me that in Niger Republic for quite some time, there have been um, increase in droughts, which has really made it difficult for farming and also cattle rearing as well, which is a trans um, transhumant livestock um, rearing, which is quite um, common in, in this part of Africa. And as a result of that, um, there was limited work for them due to skills as well as um, high unemployment rates. And so they were now involved in kidnapping. And um, like every good business person, well, illicit business pe person, you would want to look for a much more um, profitable market. And Nigeria happened to be the next best thing. And hence we had this increase in banditry. So it's quite interesting how climate change conditions impacted on economic traditional, I mean, sorry, illegal economic source of livelihood. And then that actually links to illicit economic activities. Um, moreover, looking at other um, connections, we also have the issue of, in Nigeria, we have this issue of Heda's farmers conflict has been going on for quite some time. Although recently we've not been hearing more about it. I think the bandits have taken over and made more of the news headlines. And this also is a result of climate change. Yes, there's the factor of population. You know, we have a high increase of population, so there's more pressure on land. But climate change also fits into this. We don't have traditional ranches or ranches as a way of rearing these animals. So most cases, the herders take these animals through a very long journey and they eat along the way. And most of the, um, will I say the grass? Yes, the grass or the leaves that they eat are no longer available as a result of increase in deforestation and drought. So these are some of the, um, these are some of the more glaring issues. And then real quickly, I will just mention the other aspect of um, insurgent groups. We have insurgent groups across the, um, the Sahel parts of Africa. And, um, and unfortunately, climate change also exacerbates this issue of insurgency. Majority of these people have joined Boko Haram or the other um, insurgent or terrorist groups that we have in this region based on some of the um, interrogation reports had seen, majority of them do not necessarily believe in the ideologies of this group. For them, it's a source of income. And um, some of them, their previous um, employment has to do with, again, farming and fishing and um, hunting and cattle rearing. So all of all these have also been impacted. So um, I think um, three key things we need to take from this aspect of the mechanism or the specific sectors I mean has to do with the issue of farmers headers conflict, the issue of banditry in terms of kidnapping, the issue of green criminal activities um, that also feeds into climate change conditions, and also the issue of having this, um, this presence of insurgent groups and them having access to, to an illicit market for recruitment. All right, thank you, uh, Ebi. That's quite a comprehensive summary. And uh, just listening to you, we can appreciate the complexity of trying to make these connections because of course you have this list activity already and it's it's dovetailing with the increased stresses caused by climate change so unpacking that and seeing how they um they conflate is is very difficult um so thanks for helping to walk us through that and making us more alert to that um I'd like to just finish up with you and in, in, in talking about water 
you know, uh, for many years and, uh, and now even presently, both uh, Andrew and Francois talked about the potential for coming water wars or water stresses. Um, uh, what have you heard on this? And are there examples that you would cite um, of how the increased competition for fresh water as a commodity is being captured by some of these criminal groups? Yeah, um, yes, there's, there's been a lot of research about the coming water wars. I think for me, the, the water wars are already here currently now. So um, based on my research, I think there are just two main examples I can give that I feel will be very beneficial to this conversation. We start with Lake Chad, for example. Now the Lake Chad region, in the last um, several years, there's been a shrinking of the of the lake in Lake Chad, and that has actually fed into the existing or the current conflicts in the region of Lake Chad. But to now bring in this conversation of criminal organized criminal groups and climate change, um, so we have this again, like I mentioned, at, um, you know, source of livelihood. So the Lake Chad has been a huge source of livelihood for different actors in that region and in the, in the, the, the countries that border that child as well. I mean, you have your farmers who need the water for, for planting, you have the fishermen, you have the, um, you have the headers as well. And then you also have those who are also involved in the ferry business because the, you know, the ferry people to and fro. And with the shrinking of the Lake Chad and the unfortunate issue of misgovernance, I mean, uh, the governments, in, not to you know, blame them too much, but the, the governments of that region, they've been so much busy with other much more, what I would call, um, overt or flamboyant forms of criminal, like, I'm sorry, violence in, 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 in those regions, I mean, in those states, that the issue of um, the shrinking of the Lake Chad has not necessarily been a top priority for this government or this state government over there. And so you have this competition for these limited resources. And because of the current conflict, there as a result of the you know, sh shrinking of the Lake Chad, there's been this mass migration. A lot of people have actually left the Lake Chad region looking for alternative source of income. And unfortunately, most of them are being caught in this vicious circle of illicit activity. The other example I want to bring in here has to do with, oh, so before I move into the second example, still on Lake Chad, and the Lake Chad region also has its own share of um, the presence of you know, insurgent groups as well. Again, these groups are looking for foot soldiers who would join and wage war with them. That also feeds into the narrative of, of limited economic active and limited source of livelihood as a result of, result of climate change impacts. Then we move to another example, which is in Kenya and Somalia. These two countries has in the last decade been plagued by um, limited access to fresh water or clean water. And a, a huge chunk of that um, blame has to do with the fact that um, there's been rise in temperatures and drought as a result of, of climate change conditions, as well as government mis misgovernance in those cases. Um, the Somali region, or the Somali country, sorry, has had its own share of, um, of insurgent groups as well, in addition to the Somali pirates. When, when, when you put that into the into the narrative, but the the issue is that those who are traditional headers, because I mean cattle rearing is a big deal in, in both in both of those countries, Kenya and Somalia, especially in the rural areas of those countries. So not having access to enough water to feed cattle because of the you know limited rainfall or because of the droughts, as a result of climate change, makes it um, makes the choice difficult for these people. Either you migrate to the big cities and, compare and, and compete for non-existent jobs, or you join these um, this criminal groups who are happy to have you on board and to work, work with them. In the case of Kenya, there are two dimensions that we can look at it from. You have the urban and the rural dimension. The rural dimension I've kind of mentioned when I was trying to explain the issue in Somalia as regards limited water availability, impacts on animal, husbandry and then the need to migrate or join you know, groups like Al-Shabaab and, and the rest of them over there. And then you also have the urban dimension of it. So now the urban dimension, there are two perspectives you can look at it from. You have people moving into the big cities in Kenya looking for jobs and being unable to find those jobs. And so they could either go back home and join you know, those particular groups, or they could join the criminal networks who are already existing in those big cities. Or the other perspective has to do with becoming a criminal yourself in terms of setting up shop. 
and that is where we see the water cartels that are quite um, prevalent in, in, the, in, uh, in the big cities in, in Kenya. And unfortunately, these water cartels are mainly domiciled in the, um, the slum or the poor areas of the big cities in Kenya. So there is water made available by the government, but you have these cartels capturing those water and then forcing or enforcing or forcing people to purchase those waters, water from them at a very, very high um, rate. So I think um, these are just some of the few examples I can give regarding the water wars. Thank you very much, Abby. That's great. Uh, I know you put a lot on the table and uh, really getting us to think, again, uh, underscoring the importance of the proactive uh, actions, such as in Lake Chat, uh, so that it doesn't uh, spawn off uh, all these other uh, security implications. And uh, yeah, the examples of water cartels in Kenya and urban areas, it's a fascinating uh, mixture of how uh, a, a resource scarcity is being captured by uh, criminal elements. Um, and the need for stronger governance to uh, control those resources and, and provide those services uh, uh, for, for populations more generally. So um, you've given us a lot to think about and we'll come back to. I'd like to now shift for sort of the final segment of our conversation to talk about the, the Congo Basin. And up to now, we've been talking about the ways that climate change are affecting the security environment. In this case, uh, we're going to flip it around and talk about why the importance of security is so critical to um, try and uh, um, uh, prevent the um, acceleration of, uh, of climate change and global warming on the continent. Um, and uh, the, the, the focal point for this conversation really is the Congo Basin, which is an underappreciated natural wonder for uh, the continent and for the world. Um, you know, it comprises 178 million hectares uh, of land uh, overlapping 11 countries uh, in, in Central Africa. Um, globally, it is uh, along with the um, Amazon rainforest, um, one of the two most important carbon sinks, uh, taking carbon out of the atmosphere and therefore mitigating against uh, more global warming. Um, some people refer to it as uh, one of the two lungs uh, on the planet. Um, and so it plays an incredibly important role. It also, uh, you know, the, the, the tree cover in the Congo Basin uh, affects rainfall patterns in the Sahel and in uh, the Greater Horn of Africa. Um, if this were to go away, it would um, uh, uh, affect global uh, precipitation or, and, and, and regional precipitation. Um, the rainforest in the, in the Congo Basin is also critical in that it holds um, what's estimated to be uh, 10 years of global emissions, carbon emissions. And so you can imagine uh, if that, uh, if the rainforest and the, the peat moss substrate uh, uh, within that rainforest, which also is a big carbon sink, if these are lost, um, scientists estimate that um, global warming will soar past the two degrees Celsius um, levels that uh, Dr. Engelbrecht was talking about. Um, and so protecting this uh, incredibly valuable resource is a real priority for uh, not only Africa, but for the world. Unfortunately, um, recent years have shown that we're seeing increased levels of illegal logging on the Congo Basin. Uh, and um, I think estimates are that, that we're losing about 500,000 hectares a year of the rainforest. Um, and therefore, it presents a very important strategic threat for, um, uh, for Africa security policymakers to be thinking about. So to help us talk about that and to uh, review what can be done and what is being done, I'd like to bring in uh, Dr. Uh, Olawole Ojewole. He is the ANAX, uh, 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 the ANACT organization's coordinator um, 
for uh, Central Africa. ENACT is uh, uh, an organized crime uh, observatory. Um, Dr. Willie uh, is based in Dakar, Senegal, and he's working with the uh, International, uh, I'm sorry, the Institute for Security Studies, ISS, um, as part of his ENACT uh, responsibilities. And uh, Dr. Willie has uh, written a number of uh, uh, investigative pieces looking at illegal logging uh, in the Congo Basin. So Dr. Woolley, welcome. And uh, let's get started. And maybe you could just uh, uh, tell us about who's behind the illegal logging that you're seeing in the Congo Basin. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Dr. Sigu. I'm very, very delighted to be part of this conversation. And then, like you have rightly said, the Congo Basin represents one of the last two major frontiers that we have in terms of um, um, environmental deposits in addressing uh, issues of uh, climate change, which has come to the front burner. And then, like you have rightly said as well, um, the, we need to look at uh, the losses from two angles. The hectares of forest that is being lost on a yearly basis according to different estimates, ranges between um, 500,000 to 1.2 million hectares of land. And at the same time, uh, we also need to look at um, the byproducts of that uh, illicit activities. So who are the people behind the illicit or illegal logging and timber trafficking in the Congo Basin? And we identify this at at least three levels. Um, at the lowest base, uh, the community peoples who are very close to the communities, uh, who are living within these villages and rural areas, who know where these uh, trees are, and then they profit very little at the level of the, at, at that lower, lower base. And then you have um, city contacts who have made contact with people in Vietnam and in China, because more than 80% of illegally log woods and timbers that have been trafficked out of the Congo Basin go to Asia, the Asian criminal market, to put it that way. So at the, at the second level are those individuals who have built partnership with um, um, business um, uh, interests and ventures who are based in Vietnam and China. They also profit, um, I mean, their, their profit is at medium level at this level. And what they do is that uh, they are the ones who uh, get in touch with the people at the local level. They are the ones who help with the export of the wood out of um, um, these countries that are affected. It's also interesting to note that uh, I'm actually speaking from Cameroon, uh, which is part of the larger Congo Basin right now. And these are a, a few findings that I've been able to gather within the past few days that I arrived here on issues of organized crime. One of the things that is also very, very vital is the fact that uh, the market is also expanding, and the woods are being trafficked to, 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 to Middle East, Saudi Arabia, Cambodia, Laos, all these, all these uh, other countries are also getting involved. So, and it is at the top level that you have people who are based in these countries that I've mentioned, who actually uh, process the wood for the for, for various purposes in those, in those places. And the profit maximally, that is where the major profit is in terms of the criminal enterprise that has been built around uh, illegal logging and timber trafficking within the, uh, within the Congo Basin. I must also identify the issues of pollution and connivance on the part of the state security, I mean, of the state actors who have the regulatory function, who have the security function to protect uh, these, um, these, these trees from, from being illegally uh, exploited out of the Congo Basin. And then uh, it's also important to also emphasize on the, on the, on, on the nebulous aspect of these uh, uh, activities which some people have identified that, okay, what makes the wood uh, um, exploitation illegal? At the level of the value chain, you have the operational, and you have um, how the concession, I mean, concession are being granted. 
So some people believe it is when uh, concessions are granted, uh, maybe on the basis of corruption, nepotism, or maybe on the basis of uh, access to state resources or political power, that uh, uh, illegal logging is taking place. Some people believe it is at the level of the operation where people exceed concessions that have been granted to them, or maybe at the level of exploitation, fraudulent uh, um, 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 fraudulent documentation and all those things. But I'm part of the people who believe that um, um, illegal activity in terms of logging and, 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 and exporting of wood happens across the, uh, the value chain from the, the way the concession is being granted to the way a manner in which this exportation is being, I mean, is being handled. I be, I'm part of the school of thought that I believe it's, I mean, the, the illegality is really within that, within that spectrum. And to the extent to which you can find this illegality across this session that I've mentioned, I tell you, it begin, I mean, it becomes very difficult to be able to ascertain the level of licit activity that is actually taking place within, within, the, within this uh, activity. Uh, and then uh, lastly, let me hang on the issue of CITES, which um, uh, is also very, very important for the protection of these probably endangered species in terms of trees or, or, or animals. Um, what they also do, this level of three criminals, what they do most of the time, particularly those who have the license, the way CITES operates is that uh, you, you, you present um, the percentage of those endangered species that you probably uh, have populated on the, on the certain, uh, on certain indicators. And what they do most of the times is that they go to show that, oh, we, have to, we still have 30% of these and we can exploit maybe 10% or, 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 or maybe 5% or 2%. But to the extent to which uh, monitoring is very, very difficult, uh, there's a lead to which this organ or scientists can also do. So what you find is that uh, as what these criminals do is to falsify uh, 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 environmental forestry figure, if, if I can put it that way, to, to, to be able to, to carry out their illicit activities within the, within the, the, the timber uh, sector in, in the environment. So there are, more, there, there, there are three level, three layers of criminals. Uh, you have two of them domicile within the Congo Basin. Those are the base close to the villages. Those coming from the city who do the exporting through a uh, popular port within, within the Congo Basin, Juhala port, Brasavi port, uh, those that also go, I mean, through the other side, probably through the Dar es Salaam port, and much that also flow through the West African uh, area, which also go through Nigeria, and travel as far as Senegal, based on the recent uh, 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 information that I've gathered uh, in the course of my interaction here. So uh, at, at the top level, at the international cartel, who are based in these countries that I've mentioned, and that is how the layer of criminal activity or criminal actors uh, play out within the um, illegal logging and uh, uh, trafficking of timber within the Congo Basin. Okay, uh, great. Uh, thank you, Wale. Um, uh, really appreciate you unpacking for us those three layers of criminal activity. Um, and listening to you, I'm struck by the level of uh, organization and infrastructure that is required to, you know, sustainably um, uh, you know, uh, take out these these uh, these timber from the forest. Um, you know, you need to invest in roads. You need to heavy trucks. Um, uh, you need other logistics. Uh, these aren't you know mobile fly by night operations. So it it highlights the the need for some sort of permissive environment uh, within the governments or within the operating areas uh, where these uh, criminal groups are, are functioning. Can you tell us a bit about the ways in which the um, African governments in these countries are, are, are making, them such, uh, making themselves such a permissive environment? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I, I think um, I, I would say the major challenge is commitment on the part of uh, African governments because um, attention is probably focused on some other issues um, and lesser attention is paid um, to issues of uh, uh, illegal exploitation going on in the forest. I'll give you an instance. 25% of the entire Congo Basin in terms of forestry resources and wildlife is actually domiciled within the DRC, uh, out of the six countries that make up the Congo Basin. 
uh, and then you know what the attention is on in the DRC is on precious metals. So uh, crime taking place on the side of the forest exploitation is always just on the margin. It doesn't come to the front border. And the same thing is also applicable to um, other countries uh, within the region. The Central African Republic, for instance, attention is fixated on diamond and gold and other meta uh, mineral resources that are being exploited in the country. And then more often than not, what we see most of the times is that uh, most of these countries that I mentioned are signatory to international protocols that are uh, aimed at uh, protecting forestry resources. But um, in terms of actual implementation of those protocols, um, there is a lot of weaknesses in, in, in resourcing, in, in, in surveillance, and then in mobilization as well. That is very, very minimal. So most of the times, this is where you find the environment largely vulnerable to illegal logging and illicit traffic and, um, 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 and, and, and timber trafficking within the region to the extent to which little attention is paid to these essential resources, which we actually need at the time that we're talking about the bony issues about climate change. I think um, it is this attitude on the part of government that is the number one issue that we need to unpack here. And the second thing is associated with the issue that I mentioned um, which is uh, the collusion and connivance on the part of states um, uh, actors. Mo um, most of the times, it is um, it is the permissive will or collusion on the part of the state actors that is actually encouraging this thing to take place. Um, I give you an instance by extension. There are some particular um, special rules that have been put on prohibition for exporting or even for uh, for logging within the forest. Uh, according to extant policies and laws in some of these countries. But what you find is that uh, by the time that there is pollution on the part of probably Forest Guard, the Ministry of Forestry, and even custom at the upper level of the chain in terms of exports, uh, there, there is little to which um, we can do in terms of uh, stemming the tide of uh, this illegal logging. So that is on the part of, that is the role that corruption is playing in this. It's one of the sector where corruption is very huge and corruption is prevalent in terms of the exploitation of uh, resources. And by extension, like earlier speakers have said, I will hang on the issue of um, um, security governance around these resources, which is most times very, very weak. Uh, I, I, I am not uh, adequately a key so we are talking about a vast expanse of land that starts from DRC and extends to the frontier in Gabon. Um, uh, most of the times, what you find across board from our interaction with uh, some of the security actors is that they do not have the, the, the enabling tools, technological tools for surveillance or adequately resource to be able to police this wide expanse of, of, of land and the resources there. And the last thing that is very, very important, which are apart from state actors in the course of my interaction in Gabon, in Cameroon, even in DRC, in terms of um, physical contact with them, is the fact that um, to a large extent, multilateral partnership that can enhance um, some of these issues that are raised in terms of maybe security governance is largely missing. Most of the times, the, uh, 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 around um, uh, for the border of Central African Republic, and Congo, there are instances, I mean, and Cameroon rather, there are instances whereby people come to log wood in the Cameroon territory and then they declare it as wood coming from Sierra and import it to, I mean, export it through Douala. So certification process is very weak. That is, the, that is, the, uh, that is what you get to see for, from that. So most of the times, I, I can tell you that uh, in terms of, um, advocacy support, funding support that aim at protecting the Congo Basin. Most of the times they have been externally driven. There's little effort on the part of the government, uh, the regional government, the regional block, to, to look at this thing as an a, a holistic, uh, uh, um, uh, look at it comprehensively and provide a multinational response. I mean, um, earlier speaker talked about uh, 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 terrorism in the, in the late Chad Basin, Nigeria Chad, 
Cameroon and the Nigerian Republic came together. They formed a multinational joint tax force. So what stops the, 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 the government within this regional block from also coming up with a regional tax force that can help in protecting the Congo Basin? I think it's very, very important. I talked to people within the wildlife uh, um, department yesterday, and I asked about, do they have, um, uh, what form of information exchange do they have with neighboring country? The response is that it is very, very low, and in most of the times it's very, very low. Both on the part of the non-governmental organization and much more on the part of the government. Government is, um, I mean, is, is, um, is engulfed with other issues and pay very, very minimal attention at these levels that I've identified with respect to protecting the Congo Basin. And if it's strategic or sedated, it is the fact that uh, this is the last frontier that the sandwich between the, 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 the Sahara Desert up north in Africa and the Southern Africa. And if attention is not paid to this, there's little to which um, foreign governors, foreign donors can help in protecting the Congo Basin. The regional block, the government must come together, have an assessment of the state of things and see how they can roll back the mayhem. Um, otherwise, um, the, 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 the effect is going to be scary. All right, thank you. Uh, well, you packed in quite a lot there and uh, uh, really give us a lot uh, in terms of what needs to happen uh, in terms of working with governments, uh, trying to tighten up the permissive environment. Um, uh, and you've also put on the table some thought provoking ideas of a multinational joint task force for the environment or, or for the Congo Basin. Um, uh, and uh, uh, and, and looking at this more uh, from a regional and, and international perspective. Um, um, I'm gonna open it up for questions from our audience now. So please use the chat line um, uh, for any specific questions I've been monitoring. I see some questions have already come in. And I guess to get us started, Willie, I'd like to just continue with you. Um, you've given us a lot already, but would you um, highlight uh, another two or three priorities that we should be thinking of of what can be done to um, help protect, uh, better protect the uh, Congo Basin rainforest from illegal logging? Well, I will just talk about um, the lower level of the chain, which is very, very important. And I think what is driving this is the pervasive poverty all over the places. For most people who engage at the lower level of the base in these criminal activities, some of them are uninformed that they are probably causing any harm to nature in any way. For them, it is just a means of livelihood and whatever is readily available becomes a, a, a tool for economic conversion to be able to at least, uh, I mean, probably live, I mean, a modest, a modest life, having access, I mean, to basic, uh, food, clothing, and, and what have you within the local community. So to the extent to which government has not um, been able to lift sufficient people out of poverty, there's little to which um, we can do in protecting the forest at that level, which is very, very important. And that is the reason why some of the things that we're talking about, we, we just have to link them to governance, which is very, very important. So I think that is the number one thing. And the number, one, number two thing that needs to be stressed is uh, on the issue of uh, um, um, border porosity across board, across board. Uh, Congo Basin is emerging from, from the north frontier, from the, from the west frontier, from the east frontier, particularly. I don't have sufficient information about outflow maybe through the South African direction towards Angola, Zambia, or any other part. But these three frontiers, the north towards the Sudan, Nigeria axis, the West towards carbon, Nigeria axis as well, and towards Uganda. It's, I mean, a lot that is pillaging from this area goes in that direction. So we need the issue of border porosity. And then beyond that, we also need to elevate this conversation to the AU. What is the African Union doing in this regard? What is the International Conference of the Great Lakes Region doing in this regard? Governments cannot just be meeting in Ethiopia and talking about political violence, coup, and all these other issues alone. Some of them have gone to participate in Core 26, and they will also go again to Core 27. So uh, we, uh, in terms of coming back to implement uh, what they are signed up to, 
it's very, very important that we put this on the front burner in terms of the advocacy on the part of the environmental groups, civil society organizations, people in the academia, the media. I think uh, we need to continue to raise the profile of this conversation along that line and alerting government to, 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 to their responsibility. This is very, very critical. And I think um, uh, the, the countries in the Congo Basin, I must highlight this, cannot fight or combat illegal um, logging alone or timber trafficking in particular. Without the support of the countries that are in first term, Uganda in particular, most of the wood that have been um, 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 traffic from, 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 from Congo go to Uganda. So there is a need to uh, consider external bilateral agreements, particularly in the area of security governance across I mean, between these nations, to be able to also um, 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 provide their own beat in terms of uh, supporting whatever internal response that this uh, government, the government of these countries are putting in place in Congo, in, in CAR, and then uh, uh, in Gabon and in Cameroon, in Nigeria in particular. A lot of goods traffic out of Cameroon is going through Nigeria. There's a need to also um, revisit expand bilateral agreement between these countries and see how it can be advanced in the direction of protecting the forest resources uh, within this country. I think that is very, very important. I've spoken to actors within the past five days, whether it is on wildlife crime, metal trafficking, timber trafficking, illegal logging of forestry resources, what they keep telling me is multilateral partnership, multilateral partnership, multilateral partnership. And it's important that uh, we alert government to the responsibility in this regard. All right, thank you, Wally. Um, no, it's, it's uh, very apparent that uh, given the uh, multinational uh, uh, nature of the Congo Basin and uh, the jurisdictions that uh, a stronger multilateral approach will be needed. Your description of the three major uh, illegal logging pathways uh, into the Northeast, um, out in the Southwest through uh, of the Congo Basin through Gabon and through the Northwest in Nigeria, and also um, I think underscores the need for contextualizing those responses that uh, we can't talk about it as um, just one strategy. There are going to be uh, contextualized strategies needed to, for every part of this. And so not only will you need a supranational uh, coordination effort, but uh, um, coordination uh, required at the, at the regional and, 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 and component level for, for this as well. So thanks very much. Uh, a lot to think about there. Certainly come back to that. Um, so let's pick up some of the questions and let me start uh, with one uh, that comes under the science part of it, uh, Francois. Um, if you can uh, talk about uh, a question about what, what will be the impacts on precipitation for uh, the rest of the continent if we see diminished uh, tree cover in the Congo Basin? Yeah, that is a really deep climate question. Many thanks for that. Let me start by saying that I think the, the only part of the African continent that can really modify African climate is, of course, the rainforests of the Congo. In most other parts of the African continent, the vegetation is just too sparse, and there are other aspects of climate that are just by far the dominant aspects um, determining future climate change. For example, if we look at Mediterranean, North Africa, or if we look at Southern Africa, then the big frontal systems sweep from the west to the east regularly over these, these, these parts of Africa. And they are moving over the region irrespective of the land surface they encounter. So in these parts of the continent, I would say that land atmosphere feedback processes are not so important. But if we should look at the Congo forest, it is of course a big and important regional source of moisture. So the evaporation from the forests into the atmospheres is basically a regional moisture source and that impacts atmospheric convection. So one can imagine that 
a future, coming, a future African continent with a much diminished rainforest region. And this is now, to some extent, um, qualitative speculation. But one can imagine that, that such, such, uh, such a diminished forested region will imply less evaporation, less water vapor being available in the atmosphere. That would likely negative impact on atmospheric convection in the region. So the, the likely response is a, is a local drying effect, a regional drying effect, should the forested areas be substantially diminished. Now, convection in the African tropics through the laws of physics must result in sinking air over the African subtropics. So one can, one can maybe take it one step further and say that reduced convection and reduced convective rainfall in the African tropics probably means a reduction in subsidence in, or sinking air in the subtropical parts, but that's another step further. Um, I, I would think that the immediate um, effect would be regional drying in those parts of the tropics where we, where we find the, the rainforests. So I hope that's a, uh, the most direct type of answer I think I can give to this question. I think this, it's a type of question that really can only be explored by pursuing climate modeling experiments where one remove the forest or parts of the forest artificially and see what the effects are. Few such, few such studies have been published for the African rainforests. But more extensively, this topic has been pursued in the case of the Amazon. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm largely using that analogy to, to answer the question. All right, thank you, uh, uh, Francois. Um, certainly a lot of interconnections there that we uh, see and that we don't see. Um, and uh, I think it uh, underscores the call by uh, Wole for the need for more assessments. We need to better understand uh, what's going on. And certainly some of the work that your uh, Climate Institute is doing um, will be relevant uh, for that uh, moving forward. Um, a number of the questions we've received had to do with, um, so what next? Uh, we've laid out the growing stressors from climate change and um, the impacts it's going to have. So what, uh, should the individual do? What should institutions do? What should governments do? So I'd like to go around uh, our panelists. Um, just give me your you know, top one or two things that you would like to see or what you feel is an imperative uh, for action uh, to try to address this. I think it, you know, it, it um, is obvious to, to note that you know, this is very complex. There's so many different ramifications. Uh, there's no single one thing that uh, is out there. Uh, and, and indeed, part of the purpose of this panel is to help us show the multi-layered, multi-dimensional challenges of uh, this relationship. So, um, uh, you know, recognizing uh, that, that uh, it's going to require a multi-pronged effort I'd like to hear from each of you on what, what do you see as the one to two priorities you'd like to see done in, in your areas of, of expertise? And Andrew, let me start with you. Um, okay, okay, thanks, thanks a lot for the question. I am speaking from the perspective of a media practitioner, a journalist. What we need is to make the climate story the biggest story of our time. Because at times it's very rare to find a climate change story on page one of a newspaper, a lead story. It only becomes a lead story when there is a serious disaster, say if a floods, serious a, a droughts. But this is one of the biggest story of our time. So we should make it a, as, as journalists let's continue to push our governments. Let's continue to write the stories which can make a difference. Let's be a link between the scientists, uh, the government, and the people who are affected by the uh, impacts of climate change. Of course, at times, the scientists have got no way of talking directly to the affected people, but as journalists, we should be the link between the journalists, 
between the people affected by the uh, by climate change and the scientists on one side and the government on the other on, on another side. So I think we should make it. It's a very very big story, and the journalists who are living through it, we are observing what is happening. So I think uh, it terms is so frustrating to see that uh, most of the editors they are not interested in a climate change story. They say the climate change story does not sell. They are worried about the bottom line. They are worried about making profits. They are worried about a lot of other things. But I think the climate change story is one of the biggest stories of our time. And it should be told. So that's, that's what I think from the perspective of a journalist. All right, thank you, Andrew. Um, Ibi, uh, how about you? What are your top priorities? So in addition to what Andrew has already said, I'm in complete agreement with Andrew because unfortunately climate change, it has been securitized to a certain degree in terms of we have these multilateral talks when we go to the AU or when we have our ECOWAS meeting or you know, at the more international level like the recent COP26. COP um, there is always talks about what we can do. But I think we should move from the talk and then start to implement these beautiful policies that we already have documented in our different treaties agreement, but to bring it down to the level of criminal activities and the impact of climate change on individuals who are more impacted. Um, this actually comes from the level of advocacy, academics and representative of the different civil societies in you know, countries or communities impacted. We have a responsibility to advocate for a package more like, you know, we recently, we, we all went through the COVID-19 um, pandemic and we saw different government bringing in packages or palliative in some cases, you know, to help people transition or to, you know, to survive the impact of, of, of this um, issue. So climate change um, victims should also have something like this available for them, some form of package or a transition program so they don't have to make that choice of migrating to a place to compete or, um, or having to join criminal networks as well. Then one other thing we can actually do is to bring in the scientific, the science community. Um, I know based on the little readings I've done, sometimes the science goes over my head sometimes, but there are ways whereby, you know, the, the, um, the impact of climate change on agricultural activities can be mitigated by some certain uh, experiment or something like that. So I think that is another avenue that one could could you know focus on, but more importantly, like what um, um, the Enat um, speaker said, he said something that was quite important. He said there is always this too much emphasis on the more overt forms of insecurity in in Africa. So until our leaders take this issue of climate change as a security issue, uh, as a serious security concern, then we can actually move forward. But that is actually more of the role of advocacy from. CSOs, um, civil society organizations, and academics and policymakers. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Evie. Very helpful. Um, Francois, uh, what would be the one or two priorities uh, you would put out there? Thanks very much, Joe. So I would like to talk about two interventions, two types of interventions that can happen at the government level. I think my colleagues here can, of course, much better talk about what different communities can do in terms of responses. The first is infrastructure related. For me, it is very clear that the African cities along the East Coast, vulnerable to landfalling tropical cyclones, are basically defenseless to these types of systems impacting on the city. Um, when a big tropical cyclone makes landfall on the eastern seaboard on the US, or say when it approaches Japan, they are nowadays excellent for a start evacuation plans in place. And there's a, trans a transport infrastructure in place that can within days evacuate hundreds of thousands of people out of the path of danger. That type of transport infrastructure simply doesn't exist in Beira. 
Beta, for example, has 500,000 inhabitants. Ahead of tropical cyclone Idai making landfall, weather prediction provided early warning of landfall, three days ahead of landfall. There were high confidence predictions that landfall will be, will be in Beira. But for some reason, the cyclone still found, found the most vulnerable communities living in the informal in, uh, settlements around the harbors where they always lived. They didn't evacuate. Now, part of that is the infrastructure problem. There are other reasons as well, but part of it is the infrastructure problem. There are no seawalls at Beira or at Maputo that can protect these cities against the storm surge, that wall of seawater that moves from the ocean inland. Um, in developed countries in the Northern Hemisphere, there's, there are wonderful protections nowadays to, to, to take away the, the most of the force of the storm surge. Now in Beira alone, hundreds of people died the night of landfall in the storm surge that that's, that wall of seawater moved into Beira. So African, African countries really need ambitious infrastructure projects. Now, under the Paris Agreement of Clim on Climate Change, it is possible for this type of project to be funded. For example, South Africa was offered the 8.5 billion US dollar just transition transaction at, at the time of the 26 conference of the parties. We are still waiting to see what the details are of this plan, this transaction. We hope as scientists that the South African government will really embrace this opportunity. Um, but many other African countries need a can actually reduce their vulnerability by very ambitious and very expensive infrastructure projects. They can't fund themselves. But under the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, they are entitled to that type of support from the developing world. So ambitious infrastructure adaptation projects is one thing I would like to flag. And the other, the other example I'll mention, I will use um, something Andrew said that I thought was really striking. Um, he explained that the migration that has been observed in Zimbabwe during the part of the drought to the Eastern Islands where, it's, where rainfall is higher was driven by the fact that the farmers just, they tried everything they could to cope with drought and they just can't. Now colleagues, this is, an, this is exactly what the tipping point is. Let me point out that African farmers are used to floods. They are used to droughts. They've been living with droughts for centuries. And our farmers to some extent know how to live with droughts. But now we are suddenly encountering droughts that are lasting so long that our farmers that have been so resilient can't cope with the drought anymore. So something has changed in the system. At the tipping point has, re has been reached and the droughts are now so intense and so long lasting that the coping mechanisms of the past don't work anymore. And climate change, Climate change science tells us that at least in some parts of Africa, and the ones I, parts I've mentioned earlier on, these types of droughts will now just become more frequent. So that brings us to what can be done. Um, if the South African government and the Zimbabwean government, for example, as two examples, are aware and they accept the science that in these two countries in Africa, these types of droughts will only occur more frequently, what can they do at a national policy level to help the farmers. So Andrew also mentioned that the farmers need help. So in South Africa, it means they need subsidies to help them outlast these droughts. South Africa has a very ambitious land reform program. It's because of our very unfortunate political history. But does the South African government, for example, realize that farming over the next 20 years will be more difficult than farming over the last 20 years because of climate change impacts? If we, for example, give land to new farmers and we try to support the farmers to start with, with farming on new land, will they be sufficiently supported? Will they get the subsidies to, to help them outlast these droughts? that will be tougher than what the farmers of the last 20 years 
needed to deal with. So I think there are some types of climate change impacts that cannot be survived or dealt with by communities on their own. They really need government subsidies. And in some cases, the government themselves need international investments and cheap loans for these very expensive infrastructure type projects. All right, thank you, Francois. Uh, very constructive, uh, practical ideas there uh, for us. Certainly, we'll be taking these on as uh, we move uh, on, uh, forward from, from today's discussion. Um, Willie, uh, let me turn to you. Uh, uh, you've already given us uh, some of your, your thoughts earlier. Um, uh, would you like to throw out a few other priorities? Uh, if not, I can turn to some other questions that are coming in the chat line for you. OK. Um, so go ahead. Well, a quick one, which I think I just want to quickly add is uh, one, um, I think we have come to the point that uh, we have to also join the global advocacy that is um, um, calling for ecocide to be taken to the uh, International Criminal Court in Hague, because uh, we've seen other form of crime being tried by, by, by the International Criminal Court. And they have all their successes and stories, at least uh, uh, from war, from war zone, and what we have seen. Even how the nemesis is catching up with uh, some actors, even 10, 20 years down the line. Um, at least that can provide some form of deterrence. And if, like uh, Andrew said, like uh, Pankoy said, uh, if climate change should become a critical issue in policy debate and implementation. Well, I think we need to test every mechanism that is available to galvanize local and global support to protect the environment at this critical time is very, very important. So that is the reason why I would warmly endorse the call for ecocide crime to be taken to International Criminal Court and that it should be admitted by the International Criminal Court. And the global advocacy is growing and I do hope to some extent um, is going to also contribute to providing the solution. But when we talk, well, when we talk about protecting the forest, uh, whether in the Congo Basin or elsewhere in Africa now, there's big elephant in the room. More than 80% of the woods that have been trafficked are going into Asia, and China is the principal market. Why is it that African governments appears to be looking at the other side? Is it as a result of this, this new partnership that is going on between China and African countries that um, such illicit trade can be taking place in your backyard uh, and then you, uh, you close a blind eye to it or, uh, or, or you just show not to be interested in the dynamics that are playing out in that area, in those areas. I think it's something that we need to really put on the front burner and um, call out African governments to do the needful. There are trees in China. Why are they not cutting the trees in China? Why are they fixated on African trees? And then um, why, I mean, why do we have such a level of disrespect for the African environment? For me, it's a big, it's a big issue and um, it, it might not be as simple as I'm putting it on the front burner, but from the research that are available, uh, there's no way we can talk about this whole issue. Since we know the, the destination for the, I mean, the market destination, it's also important that we see what China is doing. Um, uh, I mean, they've taken some step in terms of uh, um, blocking the criminal market as far as ivory is concerned. Why are they not doing anything about uh, timbers? So I think it's very, very important. And it is the collegiate of the African government that can take that critical response as far as this is concerned. Um, I think those are the two issues that I think uh, uh, I, I want to quickly put on the, for, uh, on the table for this conversation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, because we've had so many questions come in uh, and we start a little bit late, I'm going to do one more quick round. Uh, there's obviously more to cover, but uh, maybe we just be precise uh, with our responses um, and get a few more ideas out on the table. Uh, I think a couple of the, you know, there's three themes that I'm hearing in the questions. One is what can you do at the community level? You know, how do you get communities involved? How do they buy in to change? The second theme is this whole idea that this is a multilateral and international 
uh, issue. How do we, um, you know, how do we, you know, how do we build the coalitions that are needed for for that sort of uh, multilateral uh, response? And the third uh, is gets at the issue of governance deficits. And um, you know that you know Willie very articulately laid out the the problems of governance deficits and how this is uh, mitigating uh, a more effective response. So how do we how do we address that? So um, let's do a round again. Uh, but if you could take one, you know, take 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 one of those themes. And respond that's in the way that's most relevant for your uh, interest, your background, and we can uh, and we can wrap it up that way. And so, Willie, I'm going to start with you this time, um, and pick up on that governance issue. Um, so, you know, governance deficits, this permissive environment is so critical. Um, you know, what are some practical next steps that could be done to help uh, 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 you know, close those governance deficits that are affecting the ability to respond on the climate change and illegal logging fronts? Well, I think uh, just to reiterate what um, I think uh, we have said earlier is the fact that uh, the, the, the forestry governance uh, cannot be isolated from the general governance with respect to, to the environment, environmental governance, because um, you realize that uh, even in policy debate and academic literature, when they talk about ungoverned spaces, uh, most of the times, some of these forestry space, uh, species rather also fall within this ambit of where criminal activities are taking place on checks, and then it like, appears like a free fall for all. So in terms of, um, I think the architecture that needs to be strengthened is that security governance of protecting the forest. And the best way to do about it uh, in two critical dimensions. A diplomatic solution has to come to, to play here. Like I talked about the fact that 80% uh, uh, of the woods, we know the, 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 the market destination. So AU cannot, AU, I mean, African government cannot just be getting involved in trade agreement and partnership with China without talking about issues about protecting the environment in their backyard. Like earlier speakers have said, those things don't come to the front burner when they have this multilateral engagement. It's important, and I think civil society organizations, people in the academia, think tank, media, have a responsibility to play in this regard. Uh, that, that is the number one thing. The second thing is on the issue of surveillance, security surveillance is very, very key. Um, most of these areas you have on the, I mean, um, uh, wide expanse, of, of, of forest with, um, with, I mean, with porous border, largely unsecure and undetected criminal activities are going up within this uh, geographical space. So it is very, very important that uh, much as we call for uh, increased funding of the law enforcement, for instance, Nigeria, which happens to be my country, what is the population of a forest guard that you have in protected the forest? And it is in this forest that banditry is taking place, for instance, now. There's a larger conversation along that line to increase funding, recruitment, and support in terms of um, strengthening that architecture of forest protection. So by extension, what is very, very important is that these forests are contiguous uh, locations that, that span from one country to another. So the multilateral partnership that we talked about earlier, and there are models that can be borrowed in this regard. It's just that attention is not being paid. There are multinational joint tax force that have been put in place to, to protect countries and citizens with respect to terrorism within the big chat basin. Cameroon, Nigeria should forge such partnership as well. Countries in the Congo basin should forge that kind of partnership. And I think the last thing that is very, very important is that um, we need technological solution to be able to address these issues. Issues of certification, so that we know the origin of those products and how they are ending. And there's no way you can do that sufficiently if you, don't, if you do not have community mobilization, community group that get involved in that. You track from the base and track to the end um, to the to the finance uh, um, uh, end market so we need that kind of conversation 
We need that kind of engagement to take place. You need to organize an observatory group at the local level, civil society organization who are concerned about environmental rights, who take stock of what is taking place within the environment and escalate appropriately. And within the middle point, there's going to be technological introduction in, uh, in harvesting such data, processing such data, so that it can be uh, activated to the probably the other hand, where other countries that have also become destinations of this product are also showing commitment. We can't fight it alone here. We need the support of other international, um, other countries who are probably transit, cor transit corridor or destination market. It is just very, very important. I think those three layers of solution um, needs to be put on the um, on the table as we look for solutions to these uh, challenges. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, uh, Willie. Very uh, thoughtful, comprehensive, and you've uh, neatly uh, uh, connected the community level actions and technologies uh, with some of the, the multilateral and, and global actions. So thank you for that. All right, let me turn to uh, others uh, on the panel again, just briefly. Um, you know, uh, of those three themes, I, I, uh, the three themes I put out there. Um, uh, wh what else would you like to add uh, uh, here as we uh, as we close up? Uh, Abby, over to you. So, in terms of what communities can do, um, unfortunately, when it comes to communities actually taking a stand against organized transnational organized criminal groups, is almost impossible. But there is still another avenue, and this is where the civil society organizations comes into play. So the idea is to um, is to come up, or the idea is to ensure that. So the idea is to advocate for the use of technology to help these individuals who are in the agricultural sector adapt to the you know to to producing or rather to working under climate change conditions while also educating them on how they can maybe not probably eliminate it but they could stall it to a certain degree with some alternative methods of either farming in the case of the farmers headers it will be to, it will be good to get ranching involved although the nigerian government has been trying to do that for years unsuccessfully to get headers to you know to um, to use ranches to to head their I mean, to take care of their animals. Regarding the issue of multilateral agreements, I saw a question, there was someone mentioned some of the big five countries there. And the issue is more of compliance, though they go for all these important, very important meetings, they have treaties, they sign up on it, but compliance is more of a major issue. Unfortunately, I can't really speak to a solution because I mean, how do you get the big five to comply to some of these issues when you talk about you know, world order and powerful countries and not so powerful countries. But again, this is where the, will I say, those who are actually impacted by it, African state or African government, this is actually where the AU has to come up and speak with a louder voice and I think, um, um, our speaker from ENACT made that particular issue when he talked about why, what is wrong with China ch and Chinese trees are not African trees. So that is that. Regarding governance deficits, I think it's about time we have a security governance architecture that is expanded, you know, to focus on, on green crimes and climate change conditions in as much as we understand the importance of, of of political violent groups, of insurgent groups, and we actually see the direct impact of that unlike climate change that is kind of structural, it takes a bit of time to feel the impact. So um, there has to be that call. So again, I still come back to advocacy and, um, and the CSO, the civil society organizations, in as much as I would love to mention law enforcement agencies and the government based on our experiences in the last few decades, it, it seems like it's, a, it, it's almost difficult to get this, you know, these people to do what they're supposed to do. So hence, it falls on the civil society and the population at, at large. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you, Ibi. Uh, great points, certainly stuff that we'll pick up on. Um, Andrew, um, anything you'd like to add on any of those themes? Mm, actually, I just want to add a few, uh, especially on the issue of the, the community, community level. Because when Cyclone Idai affected Zimbabwe, Many people who were affected, they said, this has never happened. And when you talk uh, to some of these people affected by the droughts, they still re repeat the same thing. This has never happened. So when it comes to coming up with solutions, uh, there is need for policymakers 
or whoever is coming up with a solution, there is need to involve those people. There is need to explain to them what is happening because they, they are asking the same, the, the, the same question and they are raising the same issue. This has never happened. So to them, they are, it's something they are not even uh, familiar with. They, they've never seen it uh, 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 before. So I think there is need to involve them. What do they say about what is, what is happening? So I think the most important thing is to involve the, 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 the communities. Of course, the, the scientists, they've got their language, but there is also need to simplify that language so that the, those people who are affected, they understand, or even to write some of this information in their language. When you say a cup on sequestration, what do you mean? When you say uh, uh, anthropogenic uh, causes, what do, you, what do you mean? When you say code red, what do you mean? So these people should understand some of these issues so that when you come up with a solution, there is a buy-in from these communities. So I think one of the most important stakeholder in this whole issue is the communities affected by uh, climate change. So that's what I think. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, and your point, uh echoes something we saw in the chat line about the importance of storytelling uh, and needing for uh, community level storytelling in a way that uh, resonates, uh, and they can understand and, and see how and, and why they need to um, be part of the solutions for this and, and, and giving them some, some paths forward. So Andrew, you have a important task in front of you. Uh, uh, as part of the storytelling core that uh, we'll be relying on here moving forward. Um, so let me turn now to uh, Francois for our final word. Wonderful points, Andrew, I, I fully agree. But let me talk again about something different um, at, at once again at government intervention scale. Um, we have the 26th, the 27th conference of the parties coming up at, towards year end, and it, it has been, uh, this conference is supposed to, to fill some of the gaps that were left open at the 26th conference of the parties. I'm referring to specifically in terms of adaptation funding for the developing world. And a very, very sensitive issue of lost and damage. I think African countries need to be as well coordinated as they can be at COP27 and in the, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change negotiations moving forward in terms of negotiating for extensive adaptation investments, adaptation project investments in Africa. Remember, the, the developed countries that are committed to climate change mitigation, they do need the developing world to contribute its fair share to mitigation. They expect from the developing world to develop using renewable forms of energy rather than to use fossil fuels, including those African countries that have really rich supplies of fossil fuels. We think, for example, Ghana's rich oil reserves, new reserves of oil discovered in northern Namibia recently. So of Africa's coal, we have to let all of that go. That's, that is what is expected from us. It is to our own benefit to develop through renewable energy pathways. But we are entitled if we give up on the if we give up on our ability to, to, to develop using the fossil fuels, we are entitled under the Paris Agreement for extensive support, not only for growing our renewable energy sectors, but also for ad adapting to climate change. Remember that the global warming and the climate change that have occurred today is not in the first place the result of what has happened in Africa. It is, the, it is a consequence of the immense levels of emissions from the Northern Hemisphere developed countries over the last several decades. 
So they are in the first place responsible for the problem of global warming. And part of that responsibility is that they must help the developing world to adapt. And we must stand very, very strongly in the negotiations moving forward for extensive investments in African adaptation projects. And that can be infrastructure type projects, but it can also be projects that, for example, support and help farmers to cope with long lasting droughts when these droughts strike. So I, I really hope that will be a key theme for African policymakers um, moving forward. Thank you, Francois. Um, that's a great way for us to end up. Um, and so let me thank all of the panelists for your thoughtful uh, interventions and reflections. Uh, you've certainly given us a lot to think about, a lot to move forward with. Um, I want to thank too all the participants who've been watching and for your uh, valuable contributions on the chat line. Uh, we'll be taking those up as we move forward. And I guess that's my parting word that, uh, as I said at the beginning, this is a very complex subject um, with many iterations. Um, we only touched on some of them today. There's, there's uh, so much more, but uh, we'll be using this as a launching point uh, to do more work and trying to make these connections and try to unpack some of the solutions that were raised today. And uh, so we are really looking at today's event as part of an ongoing conversation and not as an endpoint. And we'll look forward to continuing that conversation with our panelists and, and with our participants uh, uh, into the future. So thank you for joining us. And uh, we'll look forward to being on touch uh, online and, uh, and in person here soon.